future doctors. Welcome back to Best Medicine's GCSE AQA Biology series for students studying in the UK. This is the beginning of chapter number six. In chapter six, we're going to be talking about genetics, inheritance, and a little bit about evolution. So to understand inheritance and genetics, we have to understand or get familiar with the concept of reproduction. Now we have in informally mentioning asexual reproduction and sexual reproduction and meiosis, right? But in this particular section, we're going to be doing them in detail. So what is reproduction? Reproduction means producing offsprings from existing parents. It can be of two types. Now you can have sexual reproduction in which two parents are there, right? A male and a female, and then they produce gametes, and then those gametes through meiosis, and then those gametes go, go ahead and fertilize and give you zygotes. Asexual reproduction is that you have clones of cells through mitosis, right? That is asexual reproduction. We've done examples of this before. We've done different clones before, right? Animal clones and plant clones and so on. So what are the characteristics of asexual reproduction? Well, it involves only a single parent, right? A single parent is required and it produces identical offsprings. If it's producing identical offsprings, then that means that there is no genetic variation if there is no genetic variation, then this means that the that the uh, susceptibility to selection pressures is great. What is that? I'll come to that in a bit. So this reproduction involves mitosis only. Remember mitosis or binary fission in bacteria. Remember mitosis. Mitosis is a cell division that does not involve any changes in the DNA. That does not involve any genetic variation, right? You have identical parent cells, identical daughter cells. Asexual reproduction typically occurs in bacteria, archaea, can occur in protists, fungi, and even some plants and animals. This type of reproduction is faster. Of course it's faster, right? You don't need two parents and you don't need all the mating processes and all those things, right? So of course it's going to be faster. Allowing many identical clones to be produced quickly. Remember we were making clones with plants and animals, right? Dolly the sheep. So very easy to make clones through this. Also, there is no need for two parents and mating behavior required for asexual reproduction, hence making the process faster. So how does this work? Well, let me show you. So basically what you have is, uh, let's start with a plant, let's say, right? So you have the ground and then on top of this, you'll have a tree, right? And then this is a tree. And let's say that this particular tree gives a small branch of itself, right? And this branch goes ahead under the ground, right? It starts developing a smaller plant mm -hmm. through mitosis. So because this small plant on the right is coming from the same cells and the same DNA as the parent plant, the big plant on the left, then this is going to become eventually exactly the same plant as the parent plant is, genetically at least, right? And so on. Now here's the thing, when you're producing all of these identical clones, through mitosis, through asexual reproduction, then the susceptibility to selection pressures increases. What is a selection pressure? A selection pressure essentially is an environmental pressure that helps get rid of less adaptive and less adapted individuals in a, in, a, in a given environment. So for example, let's say this is a particular area, right? And then you have a couple of um, identical species here. So here's identical species. And I'm going to make a non-identical one here as well. So this one maybe is a mutation. Now what would occur is that you can have a selection pressure like a disease or a predator that comes in, right? A selection pressure comes in. Now this could be a disease, this could be a predator, this could, this could be something else like a disaster. Whatever it is, it's going to wipe out, let's say for our example, all the blue species here. So all the blue species will be killed because these are identical to each other, so they are more susceptible to the same selection pressure. Like a predator comes in, a predator will kill all of them because it only eats the blue ones, right? Or a disease comes in and disease only infects the blue ones, so that's going to get rid of all of them. And that is why the susceptibility in identical species is greater than non-identical, okay? The greater the variation, the greater is the chance of survival. And that brings us to our topic of sexual reproduction. So sexual reproduction would increase the genetic variation. 
How does this work? We have been talking about this for a while now, remember, that we have meiosis, and meiosis produces gametes. For example, in humans, we have n number of chromosomes, haploid gamete here, the sperm, n number of chromosomes, haploid gamete here, the ovum, and then they come together and they fertilize themselves, and eventually we get a 2n. And now this 2n, this zygote, contains DNA from this guy, as well as that guy, right? So it's a combination of two different kinds of alleles and genes that are coming into this particular individual. Now because of that, this is going to be a completely unique person, right? That has never existed before. Unless it's an identical twin, this is going to be a completely new individual that has never existed before in terms of the composition of genes that, that this person is going to have. And so therefore, this person is going to have genetic variation, right? Through sexual reproduction, we're going to have genetic variation. So, sexual reproduction involves two parents, males and females, and each of which gives half the normal amount of chromosomes from cells called haploid gametes. These cells combine by fertilization to form a zygote, a cell containing normal amount of chromosomes, which then becomes an offspring. To form haploid gametes, a special kind of cell division occurs in sexually reproductive organs called meiosis. And we've talked about what meiosis is, and we'll review it here. So eventually, the offsprings that we get they have genetic variation, which means that they are going to be less susceptible, right? Which means that there is a greater chance that some of the offsprings are going to be able to survive an environmental pressure, like a disease or a natural disaster or a predator, etc., and hence makes the species stronger, okay? So a couple of uh, sexually producing organisms, here's a bee pollinating the pollen to the flower and so on. Okay, so after you get the haploid gametes and the zygote, what you're going to get is, in that area, you're going to get variable species. You have the red ones, and you have the blue ones, and you have the brown ones, right? And you have the pink ones, and so on. And you have the purple ones, right? Very, very different individuals. <clears throat> so because you have variation in the species, let's say a particular disease comes in, right? Here's Mr. Disease. And disease comes in, and it only kills, let's say, pink ones, and purple ones. So these all die, and what is left is this, this, and this. So at least we still get some survivors. They're going to be able to carry on the species name, right? The species itself. Now because it needs two parents, this is going to be very, very slow, and it's going to take a lot of time. It also involves meiosis, right? Remember meiosis? I've, we've already talked about the steps of that. So this is going to take a lot of time, and two parents are required, and there is genetic variation, and so there's a lot of differences uh, between asexual and sexual reproduction. And you, these, this is very high yield, okay? This is very high yield for exams, and you, you need to understand and know this. So in summary, we can say that asexual reproduction involves mitosis, while sexual reproduction involves meiosis, okay? This one involves is faster, that one is slower. Of course, it's faster because you're able to produce many copies in a short period of time. You don't need two parents, and so on. And you don't need those mating rituals and behaviors. And you don't, you're, you don't, you're not worried about attracting a female, right? And so on, like pigeons do when they sing or dance, right? Or a peacock shows its feathers. Uh, you're not worried about any of that and all the weird stuff that they do. <laughs> There's no genetic variation in asexual reproduction. So this means that the species are more susceptible to the same environmental pressure, while sexual reproduction means that there is lesser susceptibility, they're more likely to survive, and therefore it helps in species becoming more adapted as well. And lastly, there's no need for two parents and mating rituals. Well, over here we do have a need for two parents and mating rituals. So very, very important, very high yield differences, four differences I've listed out so that you can write them in a four marker, okay? Now here's a little bit of a review of meiosis, a little bit of a review. So remember that in a, in a sexually reproductive organ like the ovaries or the testes, they'll have a germ cell. So what, is, what a germ cell does and what a germ cell essentially is, is, is it's a 2n normal number of chromosome cell. What it does is that it divides a couple of times, right? Two times in meiosis. So the first time before dividing, it undergoes DNA replication and becomes a 4n cell. And after that, it divides first, right? 2n, 2n. 
and then without any DNA replication, it enters into another division, meiosis 2. So this was meiosis 1, and then we have meiosis 2 that occurs immediately afterwards, producing n number of chromosomes. So for example, if you start with 46 number of chromosomes in a normal human cell, if this has 46 chromosomes, the haploid gametes are going to have 23 chromosomes. Okay, no pairs. So here's again an overview. Initially, you have this, and then eventually this, two n number of chromosomes, and then n number of chromosomes. Okay, very easy. So that's meiosis. Uh, again, the, the the neat notes are written over here. So if you want to review them in your notes, then you can go ahead and read this. But this was better covered in its own section in the previous um, one of the previous videos. Now, meiosis makes babies. <laughs> Mitosis makes skin. Uh, another repetition of a meme. Life without meiosis. But yeah, we would all be identical clones of our parents, right? <laughs> this one. Meiosis breaks down diploid cells to produce haploid cells. And fertilization uses fusion of haploid cells to make diploid cells. <laughs> meiosis is like, am I a joke to you? What are you doing? I'm doing all, all this hard work here. Okay, so what are the differences between mitosis and meiosis? Let's have a look. So mitosis is, uh, is used for growth and reproduction. While meiosis, uh, the, the kind of re reproduction we're talking about here is asexual reproduction. While meiosis is used for sexual reproduction only, right? Because we're involved with two parents and the ability to, the ability to make gametes. In mitosis, the daughter cells are genetically identical, while in meiosis, daughter cells have genetic variation. Mitosis results in diploid daughter cells. Meiosis results in haploid daughter cells. Mitosis has one cell division. Meiosis has two cell divisions. And mitosis occurs in somatic cells of the body, right? These are normal cells of the body, like skin cells, liver cells, intestinal cells, and so on. Meiosis actually occurs only in germ cells. And these are special cells that are specially found in sexually reproductive organs. For example, testes, ovaries in humans, um, the anther in plants, and so on. So that brings us to the next part. That is natural selection. And I want to really talk about this. So what is natural selection? Have you heard of this term before? I, I'm sure you guys have, right? Well, natural selection essentially is something that we already explained earlier. That is when selection pressures from nature, like predators or diseases or scarcity of food or water, changing matters, etc., right? Result in killing of the weaker species, killing of the less adapted species. Only the, the fittest will survive, right? So which are less adapted to survive in those challenges, leaving behind more fit and better adapted species. So eventually this will kill off all the weak species, leaving behind the best, the most fit, and the most adapted species, <clears throat> giving rise to natural selection. So it's kind of like the survival of the fittest, if you ever heard of this uh, this particular very popular phrase. Now humans can speed up natural selection by something called selective breeding, and we'll talk more about this later. Selective breeding essentially is that you uh, get the best traits artificially, right? Grab the best traits and then make them forcefully uh, breed with each other. Okay, reproduction and fungi. We, we also want to talk a little bit about this. So what is this? Reproduction and fungi. Um, I have a question for you guys. Have you ever seen mold? I have. I also had the unfortunate incident of eating some of it, and then you don't want to. You don't want to ask. Unfortunately. Yep, my tummy was hurting really, really bad. So, have you ever seen mold? If you look closely, you can see thread-like structures in it. You can. And these thread-like structures are called hyphae. So we want to know about this, right? So, so mold consists of two things. Hyphae, right? These are thread-like structures that kind of look like this. And inside of them, what they contain are something called spores. Okay? So they contain inside of them spores. What are spores? The spores essentially are kind of like seeds, but formed by mitosis. Okay? Seeds are normally formed by uh, sexual reproduction, but it's a good analogy, I guess. So see, spores are formed by mitosis. 
and each of the spores can give rise to an identical offspring fungus. So for example, what I mean by this is that if one of the spores comes here and lands on a piece of bread maybe, right, if this is a piece of bread or something, right, and it lands on this and there's a good environment, it's humid and it's warm, then this spore can eventually become its own little mold. Mm -hmm. And then that mold can give more spores by mitosis, okay? So that is 2N to 2N, that is basically mitosis. That is asexual reproduction because it's forming identical things, right? However, sometimes what can occur is that two fungi can produce haploid spores, okay? So you have a fungi here, like this one, and then you have a fungi over here. So you have a couple of fungis. And then what this fungi is going to do is that this gives out a special kind of spore, maybe in very warm conditions. An N, normally this should be 2N, right? Gives out an N. This one also gives out, gives out a haploid spore. And then those haploid spores can join together and form a diploid spore. And then this one is a sexually formed spore that will have genetic variation and give rise to a different kind of fungus, a combination of the two. Mm -hmm. So, what we've discovered now is that fungi are reproducing asexually and sexually, right? Both. So, these, these haploid spores fuse to form diploid spores, giving rise to an offspring fungus with more variation, thereby conducting sexual reproduction, okay? Reproduction in plants, this is not very high yield. The way this works, and I really want to explain this, I've put uh, the diagram here. Uh, we have a couple of parts that we want to learn. So normally when you see a flower, which is the reproductive organ, really, you see something like this, right? Uh, I'll give you a couple of names. You don't have to remember all of them. That's called a sepal, okay? That's just under the petals. And then the colorful, uh, colorful bits that the bees might be attracted to, that is called a petal. We all know what that is, right? Petals. And then in the middle, you have a lot of these. You can have a lot of these. You can have a uh, maybe just one depends on the plant and you can have these as well the yellow ones as shown here uh, that's called an anther okay an anther is the male reproductive part and so anther on a surface is going to make pollen that's why it's yellow right if you've ever seen pollen pollen is very yellow so that's the anther which is which is going to produce pollen Bees will be attracted to the petals, come to collect the nectar, and the pollen will get attached to the bee, for example. Similarly, the female part is right here. That's the female part. And the female part, this, this area here at the very top, is where the pollen is going to come in from the bee as the bee sits on it and be deposited. As the pollen gets deposited, that's a haploid gamete, right? The other haploid gamete is going to be inside this area here, and that's called the ovary. So here's the haploid gamete, and that is called the ovule. And that is inside the ovary. And this part is called the stigma. So pollen gets deposited on the stigma, and as soon as it, it does that, uh, a tube will arise that will carry this pollen downwards. So this tube here is carrying this pollen downwards all the way to the ovary and it's going to come here it's going to go inside the ovary and fuse with the ovule as the ovule which is a haploid gamete fuses with a pollen grain that is also a haploid gamete then they form a zygote right and then that zygote will divide a couple of times right a bunch of times and form a seed the zygote will form the seed well the ovary you know the ovary that is here that is surrounding everything that becomes a fruit. So zygote becomes a seed, and that's where the seed comes from. <coughs> that is how sexual reproduction in plants occurs. Now, this is not a very high yield topic. I've never seen a question on this directly. So yeah, if you want to repeat this a couple of times, it's up to you. But next up, we have plants that uh, plants can also reproduce asexually in multiple ways. And we've already done this a billion times. So I'm just going to mention this here because we've done cloning of plants when we were doing mitosis. Plants can also reproduce asexually in multiple ways. A couple of ways include budding, plant cuttings, 
tubers, like potato tubers over here, right? Over there. And bulbs, if you've ever seen an onion bulb, a bulb can give rise to, here's an onion bulb, it's giving rise to each individual plant. Mm -hmm. Reproduction malaria. Does anyone of you remember malaria from communicable diseases? Malaria is a protist. It's a par it's a it's a parasite, and it uh, when it infects a person, it causes fever, night sweats, and weakness when in humans. It is carried by the female Anopheles mosquito. Okay, and you need to know the the word female Anopheles mosquito. Okay, the definitive host. Now, here's the thing. Malarial parasites, they reproduce both asexually and sexually. It's a little bit weird what, what goes on here. Okay, so remember that the malaria, when uh, it enters the human body, it enters through the mosquito. So you have a person here, right? Let's draw a person, and then this person is going to have a, a mosquito that comes in, right? Here's a mosquito. I don't know how it works, but essentially that's a mosquito, and it takes a blood meal. When it takes a blood meal, what happens is that malarial pathogens enter <clears throat> the person. So malaria is going to go into the person and it's going to go into the blood. Now from the blood, it actually travels to the liver. So two places malaria infects, the liver and the red blood cells. It actually replicates a lot in the liver as well as eventually in the red blood cells. So how does it work? It's going to go into the liver, the malarial pathogen. It's going to start just dividing uh, asexually, right? one into two and two into four and so on. So that's what's, what happens in the liver. In the liver, it's just a two in to two in, two in, and so on. Asexual reproduction in the liver and the blood. But another mosquito comes in. Let's make another mosquito here. So here's a mosquito and it's coming into this person taking another blood meal. When the malaria from the person enters the, mos the second mosquito, inside the mosquito now, what you'll have is sexual reproduction okay so it's very special asexual inside the person inside the liver as well as red blood cells when those red blood cells take the malarial pathogen inside the mosquito again the mosquito inside the mosquito the protist undergoes sexual reproduction so in the mosquito here's what would occur you would have a gamete and you have a gamete and then both of them will combine and give you 2n okay a protist that will occur inside the mosquito and not this would occur in the red blood cells and liver these are the two areas that the malarial protist goes when it infects a human being so let's read this through in humans the parasite multiplies asexually in liver cells and then red blood cells causing malarial symptoms remember the symptoms are fever night sweats and weakness this cycle repeats every two to three days, um, but when a mosquito comes in and bites an infected person, they take in the parasite's reproductive cells, and these cells fuse and develop into mosquitoes in the mosquito's gut, sexually forming new parasites that, that move to the mosquito's salivary glands. So when the mosquito bites another person, the cycle starts again. Okay? Very simple. And that concludes this little video about reproduction, asexual and sexual reproduction. Next up, we'll have the DNA and the genome. And we'll go more into inheritance. So thank you for watching. Like and subscribe. Share these videos with your friends because they're free, right? And they will love you for this. And if you want to get book some lessons, just uh, give us a message on the WhatsApp. And I'll see you guys in the next one.